Good morning, everyone. I assume everyone can hear me. Uh, thanks for showing up. Thanks for showing up in this great number. There's some tough competition in other rooms as well. Um, today, we're going to talk about microservices and basically the lessons learned we did at Atlassian. And one lesson learned already is never put a number in your presentation title because we're not going to discuss five. We're going to discuss six today. So a little bonus here. A little bit about myself. I work for Atlassian. I'm from Holland, uh, but I'm based in New York, where I work for the Trello team. So who's using Trello in this room? Oh, quite a few hands. Who is using any other Atlassian product, like Jira Confluence? Oh, OK, thanks for that. But the only thing you have to remember about the slide is my Twitter handle. Feel free to reach out on Twitter, and uh, I will reply. I will share the slides afterwards as well. So you don't have to make photos. You're allowed to make photos. OK, let's discuss microservices. For some reason, everyone wants to use them and wants to have them in their architecture. And why is that so? Why is it so important for people? Uh, because they solve some issues, but they bring a lot of other issues as well. So why is it so important? And why is it important to people to actually move in towards the direction? What are the problems in our current landscape? Not sure whether there are many architects in the room. So what happens if you have a large application? At some point, it becomes bigger and bigger. And you're having so many layers, it becomes really hard to maintain stuff. So what, what are the issues we have with a monolith and a large application? First of all, they grow fat. And with growing fat, I mean so they become large. And it's actually really hard to continue to maintain them. Your builds become slow. Your tests become slow. Um, even finding your way in the code becomes harder and harder. It doesn't fit in your mind anymore. They age as well. At some point, they become really old. And you have like all kinds of technologies inside of your code base. If you look at Confluence, for example, I think we have every framework since the beginning of Java in it. So you can see when we went to conferences and introduced new frameworks. So that's, that's hard. And if you want to change something, it becomes harder and harder. Ownership is a problem as well. So if you have a large team of engineers, it becomes really hard to figure out, hey, who is owning which piece of the code? You can make all kinds of, of processes around it, but it becomes harder and harder. And no one understands the whole code base anymore. And when you grow large as a team, it becomes harder to maintain velocity. And velocity is more and more important because we're going we're to push features as fast as we can with the right quality. But when you have to wait on other teams, it becomes harder. Or like team A broke the build again, and you get finger pointing. So it becomes really hard to be master of your own destiny as a team, and which is not a great place to be. So I want to share a little bit story of Atlassian and what we did, and give a little bit of background what the issues we've had. For example, this is a number from Confluence. We run around 8,000 build jobs a week. And I think this number is probably higher right now because this is data is like a few months old. We also have around 32,000 automated tests, which is great because it, gr it gives us great security. Like when we ship stuff, it actually still works. But it is slow and it's hard to maintain. And test, maintaining tests is just, just not a lot of fun. And we need a lot of built infrastructure to actually run these tests for every single change we make. Even if we change the comment, this will all be run, which is not optimal. Or when you push something into production and you suddenly see a big performance regression. This is a real graph where we suddenly saw response time spikes. Good luck figuring out between one, a few hundred commits like what was actually the cause and what was actually causing the issue here. So that's really, really weird, right? And it's not a fun place to be. And I'm not sure if anyone in this room likes to have a pager. And it's fine to have a pager, but not if it rings at 3 a.m. in the morning, uh, three nights in a row. That's, I never met anyone who has done so. So it's really annoying when you get paged for a, a, an issue that another team member actually made, and you are not in control to actually fix that yourself. But one thing I want you to remember leaving this, this, this session is like, because that's the danger when you go to conference like this, you see all kinds of new technologies and things you definitely want to try out. Remember that we don't have all have the same issues, right? So always think, like, why do you need that thing? A lot of stories we hear are from the massive companies that are run at large scale, and they have different, different problems than most of our applications. This is probably the 98% or 99% of companies with these issues. Dan North had an interesting blog post a while ago, and he basically said, we have to optimize for a rapid and sustainable flow of failure. So that means two things. We have to be rapid. So we have to work on our environment and how we release stuff. Uh, but it, we also have to worry about failure. Failure is the most important thing. And that's why we're here. We're here to deliver failure to our customers. If you're only doing the engineering side of things, and at some point, bad things will happen. Which kind of closely aligns with the failure we have at Atlassian, where we say, build with heart and balance. So have both things in place. 
okay, why microservice then? What's the problem? What does it solve? First of all, they're small, and that's why I probably have the name micro in it, but I don't care too much about the size, how many lines of codes. It should be some, a cohesive thing, but it's more importantly that you actually have a service that can be operated by one team. Let's say seven plus or minus two people. If they can't operate the code base, then it's probably too large because then you lose a lot of the benefits you would get uh, from microservices. The other important thing is they're independent. They have an independent life cycle, right? So if you, as a team, own a service, you can go as fast as you want. There is no excuse to actually blame other teams anymore. Of course, you will have dependencies if you depend on a service from, from another team, but that's more like a project issue. And if you get too many dependencies, you probably have to restructure how you organize your service because then you're probably not aligned as good as you should, or your servers are doing the right, the wrong thing. You can also optimize for the problem. So I think at the talk yesterday that you can be become really polyglot. You can use any language you use, uh, you want to use. However, be aware that if you introduce many many languages, you have like a maintenance issue as well. So at the last time we kind of standardized on four languages. Uh, but if you have an exotic language, for example, you have a service enclosure, and there's only one team who can maintain it. So be aware if you pick an interesting language, you'll probably be stuck with it and it will be hard to move servers around, which we'll do eventually if the lifetime, if servers become older. And the last one is they are replaceable and it's probably something you don't want to do all the time, but sometimes it's required and it's not a massive effort anymore like it would be in a model if you can do it like in smaller pieces. We had a few examples where we picked a language we weren't too happy with, so we actually rewrote the servers in a different language. So it's still an effort and still work, you probably don't want to do all the time, but it's an option certainly, which is cool. So that's the promise. So what are the problems and the patterns you have to think about when you start doing microservices? So who is running a microservice architecture in this room? Oh, quite a few hands, that's cool. would like to chat afterwards if you're still around. But I want to discuss the six things. First of all, we run through the basics fairly quickly. I want to discuss deployments, like what kind of issues do you run into then? Then testing security, and finally operations, and a little bonus one is on decomposition, which I added recently. Now let's go through the basics, basically the salt and pepper of uh, microservices. And it all starts with the 12 factor, which is probably written in 2011 or 2012. It basically gives a lot of information like, hey, how should you organize your process and how should you organize your app? If you translate it to us, does anyone, everyone in the room knows the, or like who knows the 12 factor app in this room? That's quite a few hands, that's cool. Uh, you look it up, Google 12 factor, and you can read it yourself. I'm not going to go into it too much detail. But if you translate that to, like, if you're going to build a service and you want to have a service, then it starts with a few basic things, right? First of all, you want to have exposed support because it's a web application, and you probably want to expose it over the internet. You want to have a health check. So if it's still healthy, if not, you will destroy it and you leave it out. And the last one, it should be stateless. And I put a little asterisk there because, like, stateless. It doesn't have to be stateless per se. We have quite a few services that maintain state for performance reasons. The thing that you have to be wary of, like a node can die at any given point in time, so can your service recover from that? So that's kind of the stateless you need to think of. The other thing we like to add is having deep checks, and deep check is kind of like a more expensive uh, health check where we actually check uh, whether a dependency is still up and running and whether we can access a database or we can access stuff with a network, which is really useful for picking up network snafus or basically having a weird configuration error. That's kind of interesting. You don't want to put this in your load balancer because if service B goes down, you don't want to have service A go down as well. So it's like it's a different semantics, but it really helps with troubleshooting more quickly in a complex environment. If you look at an example, this is just a JSON blob, and we basically have a set of health like you do with a health check, where we say, is this repository still up? Is this service where we depend on still up and running? And can we actually access it by doing a request? We're pretty s straightforward about code and builds. We basically have one repository per service and one build per service. And try to repeat a pattern. So if you go to another service, you basically say, hey, this is how I can deploy it, and this is how I run the test. So keep it as simple as possible. There are companies that are doing more mono repairing, but you need a lot more tooling to actually make it work and actually make sure that you stay independent as, as a group. And uh, I think the most important thing about services is that you have to keep them decoupled, right? Because that's the big promise. You can be independent, you can be as fast as you can, but you don't want to couple them. And for that's why some people say, hey, you shouldn't use shared libraries, which I don't necessarily agree with, because like, you probably want to use shared libraries, or you're going to rewrite a lot of code all of the time. But it's really important that you can bump libraries independently. So if you bump a library from to version 1 to 2, then you don't want to have like a big cycle through all your services. You want to, again, have this lifecycle independent. 
The other one is about schemas. And it's really important that you are able and flexible. You don't build big dependencies there. At some point, when you want to unleash new features, you will probably have. Uh, but you have to uh, apply Postel's law, which basically says be conservative in what you do and be liberal in what you accept from others. So be flexible, which is more a general API principle. But make sure you don't have like cascading effects all the time, because then you're losing the flexibility again. Finally, testing is an important one as well, because you want to test in isolation. I will come back to that a little bit later, but if you don't test in isolation, then suddenly you have a big mess running locally again, but now it's remote, which makes it harder. And the last one is configuration. And configuration becomes interesting, because configuration often gives you a different life cycle. And we've used to use a lot of tools, like, for example, Puppet or Chef, where you basically, hey, this is where I store my configuration. But suddenly, you have a separate life cycle of, uh, of your configuration. So you have to ask a question or ask another team, hey, did Puppet already run before I actually can push out this change, which, which is not great. If you look at the 12-factor app, it basically says you yeah, should have strict separation of config from code, which I mostly agree with, because I think it's perfectly fine to have some configuration in code, as long as not any secrets. Um, but you want to have the, uh, those baked out. So. What kind of life cycles do you basically get then? So we typically look at like three configuration life cycles. First of all, you have configuration that basically says, based on the rebuild, it's fine. Some properties that don't change often, you just put them in our source code, and we are quite happy with that. The other one is like when you need to redeploy. This most, most of your configuration, like secrets, you put them most likely in an environment variable or on the file on this, depends on how you want to do this. And it change the effect on the redeploy. The third one is you want to have instant change. For example, you want to have feature toggles. You want to roll out a feature slowly. Or you want to have a kill switch for features that can be dangerous. For example, your system is spamming uh, out the world, so you want to kill the email functionality so you can figure out what's going on. So those are the three things you have to think about. Like, uh, how do you want to deal with your configuration? But please get away from Chef and stuff like that and keep it really simple and keep it closed into one code base. And related to that is you have to treat your service as cattle, not pets. So we all love our pets. Like, we can give them a name, you love them. But, and if they die, it's, it's a big event. Cattle is that's a little bit less. So this is a bit of a harsh analogy. But I think if a service starts to misbehave, you just get rid of it and spin up a new one. You get a, you get a new one. Those are the basics. Let's go to deployments. So let's uh, do a little test here on what kind of on deployment smells. Um, Raise your hand if you require a ticket to get something in production. Nobody's looking back, so that's fine. Um, raise your hand if you only have one person in the team who is able to deploy it. Oh, a few more hands. Cool. And now raise your hand if it takes more than 50 minutes to get something in production. <laughs> ah, that's, I think still a few people are lying here, but that's, that's not sure that it's true. That's fine. So you have to really think about how you deal with deployments, right? Because you're going to do it a lot. Instead of like having one th thing you have to pick up and actually one thing that you do once in a while, and you have to have a lot of machinery in place. You're going to spin up servers. You want to deploy them as quickly as you can. And you don't want to be dependent on one single team or on your guru within your team. You want to be able to give engineers the power to actually do so. So that's why we try to always deploy an empty service in production as part of like spinning up spinning up the process. So there are a lot of tools already available to actually say, I want to have like a skeleton service. You can do Spring Boot. Like there's a talk right now on how to do it with Go. So there are a lot of frameworks that actually have a microservice up and running. And as you said, you need a port, you need a health check, and it needs to be stateless. So that's basically what you need. But then how can you get it in production? And you want to give your engineers or developers control of quite a few things. First of all, what kind of artifact uh, are you going to deploy? Is it Docker? Is it something else? We standardize on Docker. How much compute do you need? That's something you want to define. Different projects need different, different requirements. Also, like who's owning the service, which is important for when things go bad. So who's getting the page? Or who's paying for the service if you have like massive instances in Amazon, for example? Also, you want to define resources, like because a service needs more stuff. But for example, you need a database, or you need an SQSQ, or Dynamo, whatever. Alarms is important as well, because you want to, if something bad happens, you want to look at it and see what's going on. And finally, we already discussed this. You have to have a place where you put configuration, and preferably within the same life cycle here. And this is part of a bigger ecosystem, because you need to do logging. You need to have dashboards and stuff like that. So we use Datadoc and, and Splunk for it. And also, how do you deal with your networking? Wh wh where does your internet traffic is coming from? So that's why we focus heavily on declarative deployment. 
And how it looks like is basically a, a JAML descriptor where we, where we can basically define all these things, which is really easy because most developers, I think all developers know how to deal with JAML. It can be a bit funky at times, but it's pretty straightforward. And all the basics I just mentioned, you can see here in the, in the YAML file. So where we can we find a Docker container? Where can we find a health check? Where can we find a, a deep check? So this gives developers the flexibility by s setting up a YAML file, completely abstracting away how it's running, which is really helpful because you don't have to learn things like CloudFormation and stuff like that. This kind of started as a thin wrapper on top of CloudFormation, but kind of now it evolves in a larger system. But it was fairly easy to, to spin up and abstract away the complexity of AWS in this example away from our engineers. We didn't go for a off the shelf, like for example, Cloud Foundry or OpenShift, because like this is too strategic, strategic for us to actually uh, move forward. So it's kind of like this is where we run all our services. We want to be in control. So it depends on your situation. This is an example of where you put in your configuration. So it's in the service descriptor. You still store most of it like in the same source tree, but you can separate it out if you want. And that's what we do, for example, for the secrets. And these are the things you can override as well. And it just works with a command line or from your, uh, from your integration uh, CI. Same for resources. This is how you can define resources. Basically, uh, I need an SQSQ. I need five instances of this type. And as you can see, we didn't abstract uh, Amazon away. Initially, we thought, hey, we should, we should have no knowledge of, of Amazon or AWS here. Uh, but it was kind of like a lot of work, and we wanted to stay lean again. We wanted to ship value. So we basically said, it's fine with us. We're just going to have a leak Amazon, and we will replace it if at some point required. Last feature we've added recently is kind of nifty. is like having the option to have sidecars, because sometimes you need some sort of feature next to your uh, your main process to do things that you don't want to have in your process. Think about doing, uh, doing a little Nginx in the front that's really specific to your node you want to be really specific about. Or you want to have an outbound proxy that limits uh, traffic or does, does circuit break for you if you don't have that in your own code. So you can do a lot of stuff. It basically works on Docker Compose, uh, but it's kind of nice that you can easily assemble it based on the few containers you have. We currently have around 500 servers in production, but that's growing every day. So I'm not sure what the exact number is. Cool. That's deployment. Let's switch to testing. And it's always an uh, interesting object. Who in this room likes testing? Oh, everyone. Like a quality conscious audience. That's awesome. <laughs> but if you look at testing in, in Microsoft's world, this is how it looks like, basically. Like it becomes a bit, it becomes a bit messy. And if you think testing is hard, testing the model like this is, is pretty, pretty problematic. It's pretty easy, I would say. Uh, and it's maybe a statement. But if you go testing in the Microsoft world, you certainly have a lot of options, a lot of choices you have to make. So this is how we normally look at testing in general, right? Like we have a few layers of testing. And sometimes you get a little bit too much of UI. But in the Microsoft world, everything above unit testing becomes like suddenly a problem because you certainly are dependent on other services as well. So how do you deal with that? So there are two options here. One, you test against a live service or like a development environment of your other teams. But then again, when another team messes up or they go down or they're testing an experimental feature, you suddenly, or the network decides to break up, you suddenly have like flaky tests. So that's what you don't want to do. And it's also hard when you want to run it locally. You suddenly depend on something over the network. If you want to work on a plane in the train, that's suddenly not possible anymore. So you want to be disconnected. But that's why we try to mock out every service we have. And that's basically to keep things local and also in your local environment. You don't have to worry about, uh, about large, large nodes running up. So if you have a service containing 10 servers, you don't have to have 10 processes running on your machine. You can spin it up fairly easy with Docker. But at some point, it doesn't scale out anymore. And you need a fairly big machine to actually run your dev environment, which, 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 which sucks and is wasteful as well. And initially, it's kind of like, hey, let's just spin it up locally because that's f fast and quick, but it doesn't scale out. So at some point, you have to make a call you when you want to do that. But I would say do it as early as you can to try it out because you have to do it at some point. So you have two options to do this, right? You can do it in process, or you can do it as an external process. I'm a big fan of doing it externally, and I will explain why in a minute. This is how you can do it in mock. Uh, I'm a big Spring fan, but I'm a Java guy, so that's, that's probably why it is. Um, and we use Spring profiles for it, so you can basically, in this mode, we just spin up a, another beam with a different implementation. I think the problem with this is, is it's fairly limited because you have to think upfront what kind of test case you want to have. And you probably, 
have a lot of test code leaking into your production code if you don't if you're not careful. So that's why I prefer the other way, which is Wiremock. It's an external mocking tool. We use Wiremock. There are other ones as well. And what it does, you basically spin up an external process listing on the port, and you can define in JSON what you expect on certain responses. So you can say this endpoint basically gives this response. And it's really cool because this is how you can easily mock out like error conditions, which are the ones you want to test most, because you will have failure in your environment. So how do you deal with that? So this allows you to actually give a lot of model a lot of error conditions, which is pretty cool. Which would be really hard if you had a real endpoint, because then it becomes a lot harder to actually get error conditions, or you have to build them in by some sort of parameter. So this is quite powerful. But it gives you a new problem as well, right? Because suddenly you have a mock, which you're not sure whether you can still trust it because it's not real. So how do you deal with that? And there are a few options for that, right? First of all, you can rely on monitoring. So it depends on the system. You can just we push it out. If things go bad, we roll it back. So we, we, f we are fairly flexible. But it really depends on your, your system, right? If you're a bank or if you can't have any failures, then you probably it's a little bit too risky. But for some features, it can be fine. If people can't see an attachment or add a comment for a little bit, maybe that's, that's fine in your business. Because like adding more tests will give, give you more, uh, more cost as well and will slow you down slightly. You can also rely on the stable API. So if you already have an API that's available to your customers, you probably won't have end-to-end -end tests with all of them. So you probably have some sort of regression testing around your API already in place. So if you have that in place, you probably can trust as well. So that gives an additional layer of security there. And the last one is, is contract testing, which is became popular uh, a few years ago. And it's actually there's some tooling around, for example, Pact, which originated in uh, a team in Australia. But it's, the tooling can be hard, and there's a lot of work to actually set it up. So we are still a little bit on the fence whether that's the right thing to do. We're currently experimenting with, with generating contract tests based on Swagger, defini Swagger definition or open API currently. So we actually want to figure out, hey, based on the contract we already have, can we generate those tests and actually don't have to do it manually, which, which is a lot of work. So still more news to follow, but uh, still a little bit on the fence there. The last check we have in place is a semantic check, which is not really specifically to microservices, but what it basically does, before we put it back in the load balancer, we actually run an additional smoke test, and if that's successful, you can actually put it back. I'm not a big fan of these because they're really late in the game, and they m most times rely on external services as well. So if, if they break, it's really hard to figure out what happened and why they, why they actually broke down. So if you don't need them, get rid of them. I'm, I'm keen to get rid of them, but I still have to convince a few, few people here and there. But they're a the last line of defense. So if you keep them small and only do critical functionality, they can catch some issues you normally wouldn't have found, which is cool. Cool. That was testing. We are halfway. Everyone's still with me? OK, cool. I assume so. I can't hear you anyway. So, uh, <laughs> so let's talk uh, security. So if you look at security, suddenly with Microsoft, you have another issue as well, right? Because if you look at the web, there are quite a few standards to deal with, with security. You have OpenID, which is already fairly old, and not a lot of companies are using it anymore. You have OAuth through, and you have OpenID Connect, which is basically uh, I identity added to OAuth. And they're all pretty good, but they don't solve the issue with how do you deal with securing uh, services that are communicating with, with each other. So how do you deal with that? And we took us quite a while to figure out how do we want to do it. Because you can say, hey, we trust our network, so we block down our network, and then we rely, if servers are in the same network, they can just access each other, which is fairly risky, right? Because like, if some servers get compromised, suddenly you have access to everything. Or if a library has like a server-side server request forgery bug, which happens quite frequently and more than you think, you're suddenly exposing all your APIs, internal APIs, to your consumer. That's something you don't want. So that's why we came up with our own uh, protocol. And don't worry, the security side is, is open standard. So we didn't invent something ourselves on, on the security side. And it's called ASAP. I didn't come up with the name. It's Atlassian Service Authentication Protocol. And it's a fairly straightforward thing on how to deal with security. Because what we basically do, we add a JWT uh, to every request we make between services. And the big advantage of using JWT is because you don't have to go back to a central service to verify tokens anymore. You can just cache the public key of the calling services, and then you don't have to worry too much about going back and forth, because this will happen on every request, so it needs to be fast and quick. So if you look what's inside the JWT, uh, it's fairly straightforward as well. Or it's just a key that's being signed uh, with the private key of the calling service, and the every service that's, that gets the request has access to a public key based on the definition we have. 
And there are four important things in this key. I got rid of all the JWT stuff that's there around for being around. And there are things in support, like the key ID. This is what we use to pick up the public key. So based on this, we, can, we have a central repository where we have the public key available. So the receiving service can fetch the key, cache it for a little bit, and actually authenticate whether the, the request is valid. And in that key, we have three important pieces of information always. First of all, is the subject. And that's kind of like the identity of the user making the call, which is really neat, because you basically have the identity of the user making the call throughout the whole flow of, of the service being called. Second one is the audience, like who's being called. And that's the service. And the other one is like the issuer, which service is calling. So every service can kind of decide, like, is this service allowed to call me? And if not, we just uh, say no to the request and, and, and kill off the feature. So basically, you secure your service. And uh, as this JWT, you can add all kinds of additional claims to it, which is quite nice. So if you want to add more roles or permissions, then you can basically do that fairly easily. It's available online. We open sourced it. So this is the URL where you can find it. Give it a try. Give us feedback. We have libraries for Python, Java, Node, and Go, which is like the four main languages we use. So give it a try and let us know what you think. OK. Operations. Let's go to the fun bit. A little quiz. So you have 100 pounds or kilo, that's an American thing, uh, of potatoes. And they contain 99% of water. What happens? if you dehydrate into 98% of water. Any, any takers? No? For me, it was kind of surprising. And it's called the potato paradox. And you end up with 50 kilos or 50 pounds. So by uh, removing 1% of water, the weight dramatically changed. You can find out the math uh, online. Go for it. It will take you a while to figure out. But it's, it's pretty, pretty amazing. But why is this important in the microservice world, right? Because you suddenly have a similar issue. Well, how do you deal with a system uh, that already, with your 30 servers that have an uptime of four nines, which is pretty neat already four nines, because it's only four minutes of downtime per month. How much, if you have 30 of these servers, what will your, how will your downtime look like in, in a month? Any, any guess? It's two hours. So based on adding the complexity, you run into the issue where you suddenly have to deal with more failure. So you, because you have 30 moving parts, your change of failure becomes a lot higher suddenly, which is, fairly tricky. So you have to be aware that, that failure is actually imminent in such a world, right? So how do you deal with that? And these are actually well-known patterns, but sometimes you say, hey, I want to defer them because I don't think we need them yet. And I think that's what we, for example, did with circuit breakers. We kind of said, ah, we probably don't need them yet. They, they, they look fancy and look cool. But at some point, you run into issues and you thought, ah, if you only would have added like up front. So Three things you definitely need to do up front and think about how that fits in your system. There are tools available for all of it, so that's, th that's not the issue. It's more like make sure you have it in place. First of all is log aggregation. We use Splunk, but you have Logstash. You have so many tools around it. You circuit breakers as well. I think the pattern has been made famous, or, uh, famous again by Netflix, and they have cool libraries around it for Java. And request tracing, which was kind of like open source initially by Twitter. So. It's a little bit of a confession. This is a screenshot I made three years ago. So this is how I had to go into my system to figure out whether everything was still up and running, like eight terminal windows, and see, hey, is everything still healthy, which is not the great spot to be. We replace this with aggregated logging. And the, the good advantage of that is like engineers can go nuts on actually building out the, the insight they want to have, right? So it's not only, hey, we're adding this capability, because suddenly you generate so much insight in your system, and logging becomes just such a key part of your development environment. So you can actually start to get all kinds of cool stats and make decision, technical decision based on that, which is really can drive the backlog and the stability as well. The same for circuit breakers, and they're cool in many, many ways. First of all, if, you wanna, if you're in a distributed system, you certainly want to know more about your response time, because you're going to lose more time on the network, right? So they give a lot of insight like on how much time do you spend everywhere, and where should you optimize, or is, is one, one service consuming too many other services, and should they be rearranged or something like that? Also, back pressure. It's really important because service will start to fail, so you basically have to deal with, like, hey, what if a service becomes slow because you put so much traffic on it? But sometimes you're not alone in the world because maybe your service is putting pressure on it, but there's another service that's adding even more pressure. So it's not only your service that, that you should control. It's basically if the service gets slow, you have to start and respond on how to deal with that. And lastly, it's the fallback. So because failure is imminent, what we already discussed, you suddenly have to figure out, like, what do I do in case of a failure? 
And we all know, like, if, if, if an exception happens, we just ignore it a little bit and we show a 500 page. But it's not acceptable for our users, right? So a lot of times you can just fall back uh, of degrade gracefully. For example, y you don't allow users to add comments for a while, or you don't render these attachments anymore. So that's kind of like quite neat. And you make it part of the programming model, so you have to think about it up front, which is cool. Again, on the logging side, they get create a really cool insight because you get a lot of data from them, so you can see, hey, what happens in the system, and how often does the circuit breaker pop up and actually deal with that. Last one, request tracing, which is a fairly simple process because by adding headers, uh, you have a parent trace ID, and based on that, that, that one will be forwarded to all calls, and every service next will add a, a, a child child span ID to it. And based on that, you get a whole trace of how your service is being called. And if you render it, this is done via Zipkin, you get this information. There is one problem with it, though. You generate way too much data, because it's on every request. So we sample it, and that sucks, because then sometimes you want to figure out why this request failed, and then it's not in the sample, right? So it's, it's, it's a bit tricky here. Uh, Uber just open sourced uh, their own solution. It's called Jager. So have a look and see whether it fits in your system. All right, then how do you deal with operations? And if you have a large application, you typically have an ops team or an operation team, like they preferably, hopefully they're sitting in the same floor or in the same area, or it's even your team. Hopefully they're not sitting on the other side of a ticketing system. Um, and the problem is with that, that the ops team is not very much in control of dealing with incidents. So they get paid in the night. One, they can't solve it themselves, and two, they don't have any, a lot of power to actually influence the roadmap. That happens a lot of times. So they get paid, but nothing improves. But if you have a large application, making the team responsible is hard as well, right? Because it's way too big to actually deal with the application. So it's really hard to move to a full uh, model with a large application. So in a service world, it becomes a lot easier because we already decided, like, hey, we want, don't want to have the size being larger than one team. So that makes it easier to make the team responsible as well because the whole team will know actually what's going on in the service and the whole team will actually drive towards making it better. So if they get a page in the middle of the night, they're probably going to add uh, something to, to the backlog the, the next day or fix it the next morning when they come in and say, hey, I don't want to have this page anymore. But that's why every service is owned by the team and we don't want to have a separate option anymore. We call it your build, your run-in. So basically, if you decide to build a new service, that's fine, but you're responsible for it as well, 24-7. So that's why people think like, hey, do we need a service that's belong to uh, an existing service? But, but it gives like the engineers to actually control uh, the system and also build it as such that it uh, gives the right like performance and also the stability you need, uh, so you don't get drained by by being called in the middle of the night, which is quite neat. And there is won't be an ops team that's tired and doesn't see any improvement anymore. <laughs> Number six, almost there. So this is kind of like around getting rid of the models, this is a hard problem, right? So how do you do it? And for at last time we kind of said like, hey, the monolith is deprecated. Like, and that's not for every product, but basically this is what we set for Confluence. And it's important to actually make a statement because otherwise features will be always be important, right? Because like you have this deadline or you want to ship this feature. So you always say, oh, let's add it to the monolith. And it, it, instead of becoming smaller, it grows again. And that's something you don't want. Obviously, you want to be um, thoughtful about it. So if you're going to add a feature that would probably add a few hours, you're probably not going to decompose it into a three-month project, right? So you have to find some balance there. But the overall goal should be to reduce the size of the monoliths in, in the future and have some sort of plan for that. But if you look at Confluence uh, here, it's like where we started with infrastructure service first. And they're kind of easier, right? Because they're kind of like well hidden and they're all like more framework stuff. Like think about a scheduler or think about attachments. And they make a lot of sense to have actually in a shared service as well because every application probably needs it. And they're not really belong to the, they're cross kind of concerns, so they don't really belong into the real app. Same for front-end, right? Um, that's one that's obvious as well. Uh, for example, Confluence was built with JSPs like in the, in the good old days. And I never met a front-end engineer who was very happy with, with Maven. I actually don't know many engineers who are happy with Maven, but that's, that's, that's another thing. But with this, if you have the front-end separated and move to more like the service is just an API, then you can give front-end engineers the tools they like and they want to use and they can pick their own frameworks, which is pretty neat. 
But it still leaves us with the issue like how do you deal with core functionality? And how we try to do that is actually when we build the new features, we want to focus on ownership again. As we said, like servers should be owned um, by a team and the same for features, right? So we want to have code that's maintained by one team. We also want to have a pipeline that's owned by one team. And we also want to have like instances that are owned by one team. So basically when we build a feature, but how can we compose it as such and build it as such that we actually have make one team responsible for it? And sometimes you ha need help with other team as teams as well because you have to deal with services uh, or you need features from an uh, other API. But this is kind of like, hey, this is where we aim for. So this is fairly fresh because we just kind of started to recently decompose core functionality. And if you look at how it used to work, we have a, a front end, we have web uh, mobile clients, and they're all talking to the monolith, which is an API. So let's move that thing to the side and don't touch it anymore, at least only to delete code. And we decided to add some sort of like anti-corruption layer to it, a proxy that's basically where all new features will be targeted towards. So that's kind of like um, makes the clients transparent on where they're actually calling to. Uh, we used to decide for GraphQL on this, this example, but you can do a REST API as well, or whatever you would like to do. And with that, we can basically say, uh, when we add new features, we add specific service that, 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 that actually operate as such and provide that functionality, and we can slowly shrink the monolith. And you could even say you can even add the proxy already, and for the clients, it doesn't. It looks like they're talking to a new service, and you can decide on the pace of the monolith. But this kind of like separates these concerns as well, and gives you an option and makes it less complex. All right, what should you take home? First of all, think about the basics. What's the service? How does the service look like in your organization or in your team? Secondly, how do you want to deal with deployment? So, how do you want to deal with deployment? Like you. To, you're going to do it a lot, so you have to have something in place. Either build something by yourself or something uh, off the shelf. Also, security. Have a plan in place. So how do you secure services? Because suddenly you have many, many processes running and many, many endpoints out in the wall, so they have to be secure. Same for testing. How is your test strategy? Do you have one, spin everything up and test it as such? Or do you in a nicely isolated manner? And also, how do you deal with operations? Are your teams capable of taking responsibility? But the most important thing is that you have to focus on failure. So if you're going to do this, what kind of failure does it bring to your team and your organization? That's it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we still have five minutes left. So if there are any questions, then I'm happy to take them. Sorry? Yeah. yeah. Domande, alzi la mano e passo il microfono. Yes. <coughs> I have a question about the UI. Mm -hmm. Because I think that we are doing a great work to decompose the backend with microservice architecture, but we still have a monolith on the UI. Because it's, it's difficult right now yeah. to have different teams that decompose the UI part. Are you work on the UI side? Yeah, it, we're still struggling with that as well because it's still hard. We s can you hear me? Okay, so we're still still struggling with that part as well because like we nicely decompose in the back end, but we're still having a, a monolithic front end, and different teams make different decisions. So if you look, for example, I think the Jira team is exploring currently something quite interesting. Uh, we are using React for most of our newer UIs, and they kind of said we create separate applications, so have multiple React apps. And, and glue them together at the end. So basically trying to decompose as such. That gives side effects as well. For example, you can't have one state tree for your whole application, but it gives a, re a clear separation of, of, of concerns on the, on the front end as well. And you basically have a clear boundary. So that's kind of like what we're experimenting with on the front end. But uh, the people from Zalando gave an interesting talk, like uh, Mosaic. They, do, they are fairly extreme with it. So, but it's, it's still figuring it out because normally you want to have some shared state, and if you don't have shared state, then it becomes really hard to reason about your application. So uh, we also decided against it for a few other projects because the UI was too small. Uh, but for Jira, it was a really good example where we say, "Hey, we have it's such a massive application. That's why we want to treat it as separate, separate uh, React applications that we glue together at the end." Okay, thank you. Right. Uh, I have a question about testing. I am 
understand that uh, uh, using Mox you can uh, uh, test uh, a single service uh, um, atomically, mm -hmm. say. Uh, but eventually you still have to do tests uh, which includes uh, more services, tests uh, or special tests or virtual so Could you keep your mics like this? Uh, okay, yes. Sorry. Okay, thanks. And so how do you uh, do uh, tests uh, uh, which regards uh, uh, more uh, than one service uh, end-to-end -end test uh, apart from manually testing them? Oh, uh, like even if you have multiple servers, you probably spin up multiple mocks. So if, if you have one service that depends on three servers, then you do it as such. But we always always have like a, a, a staging environment in between as well. So if you want to wanna do some testing against a real service, you can get it into the staging. And if it's really a risky change, like most features we ship behind a feature flag. So we push it out in production and only unlock it for one user ourselves and, and verify it if it's, if it's a risky change. But um, we don't try to do end-to-end -end service tests like locally or in, in CI. It's more like on either on a staging environment or in production. OK, thanks. No worries. You said that uh, you're using you are suggesting declarative deployment. Does it mean that you are using a resource scheduler that supports the declarative deployment? And if so, which resource scheduler are you uh, using? Currently, we're not using any scheduler uh, because it's basically what the script the, the, the script does. It, it's being translated to CloudFormation stacks. So we basically generate CloudFormation. But it has its issues as well. For example, redeployment is still slow. It takes around 10 minutes to spin up a new stack. So currently, we are moving towards Kubernetes. And that's our choice of technology. So m most of the servers still run on, 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 on plain AWS. But in the future, we want to move to Kubernetes. And we have a few servers already running up, but like most, but Kubernetes is our schedule of choice. OK, thank you. No worries. Uh, do you do end-to-end -end testing with tools like Selenium? Yes, we do. Okay. How you organize the environments for that? Uh, the, the every Every service has its own uh, set of tests. Uh, and Selenium runs like against Mox. So if you run Selenium in, in CI, then they run against Mox, so not real services. If you look at the, 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 the semantic checks I was referring to earlier, they are basically running against a real environment. So basically, before they go into the service goes into load balancer, they're actually being executed against uh, the real service in the, in the production environment. So only only to, to one service, so not yeah. uh, no 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 because that's uh, we have a few teams who have like one end to end smoke test, but then you get like a dependency again between teams because then suddenly uh, hey the test breaks who did it then you don't have that separation anymore. So I'm kind of keen to actually keep it uh, as isolated as possible, unless you have a real good reason to actually have like an overall test, an end to end. Otherwise, like every service should like hit the things that. The service, think is, the service owner thinks it's important. Okay. All right. Thank you. I will be around, so hit me up. So